sauce and every year, every time we'll rotate to different city with the same name. But we were like, no, we'll do a Goa Foss too. We'll do Beach Foss in Goa as well. So, uh, now coming to the topic. Uh, we have uh, three panelists in the panel discussion. We have Renju, she is the CEO of Tech for Good Community. She'll explain more uh, in the introduction round. We have Vipul, he works for UNICEF. He's also sleepy like me uh, that night, that evening. Uh, we have Frederick, he has, a, he has already given a talk today. So I'll just pass the mic for them uh, to introduce. Thank you, Vishal. Hello, everyone. My name is Rinju. I am from Tech for Good Community. It is uh, an organization that's been working for the last six years to build awareness, uh, improve capacity, as well as look at solutions and implementations. Uh, primarily focused on NGOs. There are over 30 lakh nonprofit organizations in India, and our focus has been to kind of play that extended tech wing and support role uh, and improve their own capacity so that they don't always have to depend on external resource and ha who also wouldn't have that kind of budget to be able to run and do the work that they do and they work on some of the toughest development challenges and that's been the organization that I've been a part of. Thank you. And as you rightly said, I'm extremely jet lagged. Uh, I'm coming from 12 and a half hours time zone shift. So excuse me if I fumble across my words. I'm Vipul. I work with UNICEF Office of Innovation where I lead open source. Uh, part of my job is about setting standards and policies for how we use open source, how we promote open source, or what UNICEF is doing in this space. But also I work with a lot of countries and companies, country offices, in trying to tell them exactly what's the right way to do open source or how to be a model open source present, right? And that can be anywhere from choosing the right license for your business model, business strategy, to having setting up the right communities, or how do you work approach with those. Before joining UNICEF, I used to work with Red Hat. I think a lot of open source folks would understand and know Red Hat. I used to develop Fedora project and CentOS. Uh, these are Linux operating systems, so I was very close to that, a lot of platform engineering. And I'm also in Fedora Council as their DEI advisor, so I'm very much uh, passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion in open spaces. Uh, sustainability or general software and something that our panelists mentioned, how do we do more cross-border collaboration and not spend time in reinventing the wheel? How do we adopt uh, solutions? How do we more cross-border collaborations to reduce redundancy and do more software good? Uh, reach the unreachable using open source. I truly believe uh, this is coming out of Stephen Jacobs, who is director of Open at RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology. Digital infrastructure is human infrastructure. And we need to do digital infrastructure which is revolving around children, women, and general humanity. And how do we use open source to reach the most unreachable and vulnerable communities? So excited to talk in this panelist. And I, I came here, again, as, as you know, jet lag, mostly to hear the panelist. And I was invited in the panel at the last discussion. But excited to be here. I, I live in Bambuli, very close, short drive from here. And yeah, very excited to meet Goan Foss community. And at one point, I'll definitely do a Foss and Fedora project uh, community dinner or just generally meeting and doing more Foss. Thanks. Uh, people are fed up of me saying I'm not a techie, but that's a fact. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've, I've come a long way in a certain sense. In the 80s, we were the guys who were protesting about the influx of computers into the newspaper industry because we felt it would kill our jobs. Uh, I've been using te technology a lot, very intensely, maybe ineptly, but I feel very strongly that, see, uh, whatever we do in life has to have some benefit from someone else. That's when we feel the most satisfaction about our jobs. Whatever we earn will come and go, but the satisfaction we get from a job done well, job done well, is enormous. And as techies, you all are very well placed and privileged See, the Indian techie should not be underrated. Don't think that India is not contributing to Linux. We cannot do it. Someone in the West is doing it. You are sitting on a, on a gold mine. And if you all use that, even one tenth of that knowledge you have to doing something which has impact, it will have a huge, huge kind of uh, snowballing effect. And uh, somewhere along the line, I put together a small experiment called Bytes for All. As I was telling someone, the name also was copied from another group called Access for All, which was in the Netherlands. But our job was very simple. We were not techies, so we kept collating the experiences of others and just 
creating a simple e-newsletter e which was plain text, plain text newsletter, not even HTML and sharing it around and uh, people really appreciated the kind of work that was going on no? and we kept reporting on it. So if you, what the mind does not know, the eye does not see. So if we start looking for these experiments, we will find lots of them. The old letters are all somewhere scattered around on the internet, you can find them. And uh, at one stage, I'm not boasting, but we were ahead of the mainstream press because the press is looking for press notes and those kind of things, and they they're not they're not aware of what is going on here. So my humble request to you all is take on these big challenges that will make a difference in your lifetime, may not be in my lifetime, for the country as a whole because we have these skills which the country needs very badly. Export dollars we can always earn. But you will never get that satisfaction which you get from making a difference to people's lives. Whether it is journalism or whether it's technology. Thanks, uh, thanks for the uh, answer. So I also studied engineering. But, uh, am I loud enough? Yes. 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 I think so, I can do that. Yeah. so I also studied engineering, okay, but uh, before that I always felt I should go to a literature, uh, you know, study literature. But uh, I think a lot of here, I mean, might have uh, chosen because of you know the family and other people have believed that it's a secured uh, you know subject to study. And when I joined college, uh, for me it was oh wow, what is this? Why what people are talking about internship? For me it was an alien word. What is uh, programming? You know why? How how WhatsApp works? A lot of questions starts coming to my mind. Okay, and I started wondering uh, using internet. I started using internet. Okay. And I realized, okay, there's so much thing I've never experienced, never seen before. And started meeting people, going to events in Cochin. I started in Cochin. And I realized the, uh, I, I realized the fact that I have learned nothing so far in my life, 20 years, 22 years. Uh, and then that's when I started uh, organizing events, uh, creating communities in my college, clubs in my college. And I felt the need because I was in touch with a lot of people who can come and uh, deliver a good talk, help students uh, to uh, you know learn that they can start building something. So I become a facilitator of all these events happening in college, a lot of uh, city level uh, meetups in Cochin. And that's how I ended up ended up, ended my uh, uh, journey started my journey at Force United. You know I, I did an online hackathon in uh, before pandemic. Which was nobody, nobody, you know, even used to think about online event, uh, virtual hackathons. And the point is, uh, what he mentioned, it, it's not just about uh, the salary, you know, we we get every month. It will come and it will go somewhere, right? But the impact uh, will create will give us a lot of satisfaction when you know we are walking when we are old and walking, you know, in the courtyard, right? So okay, so coming back to the panel again. <laughs> Uh, my question to Renju. Uh, okay, I'll give another story before that. So, I when I started uh, when I work, when I started working at Force United, my uh, second thing I picked was helping NGOs with the tech, and I picked ERP Next. This is one of the tool uh, open source ERP tool uh, built by an Indian company, uh, Mumbai-based company Frappe. And I started learning Frappe ERP Next, and and I uh, I for an, for I think 15 months of time I worked with uh, dozens of NGOs, and I find a lot of difficulties working with them. I mean, the management change. Once you uh, once let's say we are an NGO and you are using a software, the moment uh, somebody comes and say hey, hey we'll help you with open source, and you should do this. Maybe it looks easy from my side, okay, yeah, yeah, you should use open source, but, but the people, the manager at the NGO, they have to go through a lot of changes, uh, the way the, their, their employee use the software, the process while, you know, uh, whole software is being, being uh, customized or made, right? So my question to you is, how do you, uh, how do you deal with, uh, since you said you work with a lot of NGOs, how do you deal with this, uh, the mindset change, the adoption uh, of the software, because it's not an easy job, uh, especially when they don't have much, especially when, the, when they don't have much budget in you know in the pocket, and they can't uh, they can't, uh, and they also uh, the, the, even the employees right who use it or the or the person who let's say there is a, a CRA, 
So the person has to go through a lot of training again, unlearn, then relearn, right? Because of system change. So how do you, how do you convince the NGOs to adopt FOSS? Okay, I'll, I'll start from, am I audible? Yeah. yeah. So, um, I'll start from much way ahead and upstream of how non-profit sector generally looks at technology and the kind of organizations we have interacted with. Um, the minute you go and ask, we are Tech for Good community or we are going to uh, find out how tech plays a role in your organization, usually there is a withdrawal from the organization. Um, unless they are fairly big, has some kind of sizable budget, um, our work largely involved in grassroots organizations and finding out what is lacking there. So they are all involved in collecting data, um, storing data, visualizing it. They will have to have an MIS, etc. But the organizations we started meeting in rural Raichur and rural Thiruvallur would have tons of paper member forms and they would have stacked it in shelves. And uh, one such organization I remember was called Chakrata Mahila Sankhita. They are in one of the poorest districts of Karnataka. They lost close to like thousands of member data during the floods. And so uh, many years of work that they have done, um, they wouldn't know now how to proceed next, which funder to go to next, now that they have lost this information. So uh, this, is, this is one example of a kind of organization. So, we can't even get into adoption and talking about that to a system like that. But then there are others who would have, who have come to us who use, who have spent a lot of money in proprietary software. Um, the teams change, but uh, they wouldn't know who have the, who has the login and the access and where the uh, uh, where the analytics they have done lie in because of that kind of turnover organizations like that have. So uh, before we get into the adoption piece, we do a huge and a very human level interaction of te assessing their tech. And this tells us in terms of just in, in the form of a maturity of technology, where do they stand and how the organization's project management is, or how they communicate with them internally in their team, externally to their stakeholders, um, where, uh, how do they make decisions because of this, etc. So, tech comes in at a march in the end point of understanding the program of work because they are going to see organizations like a Tech for Good community or a, or a lab or a Tech for Dev. All of us, though the vision is aligned, uh, the fear of the minute we step in, is it going to be high budget? Then when you introduce open source and then talk about, it is a whole new world for organizations now. When they get, I mean, you are part of Oasis as an alliance and the thousand plus NGOs that we work with, very minimal awareness into what is available in terms of open source. And it's mind blowing the number of organizations we've helped set up ERP Next as their um, MIS or CRM systems and then introducing them to even something as simple as Kobo Toolbox to collect data. Um, move from paper, move from Google Forms to just do that so that your field staff can use it well. So adoption from that point of view, we try and drive it from the founder or, or, or someone who's able to make that decision, see value in it and a big part of our process is to also put out good stories of impact of NGOs who use such good technology, who are able to customize it themselves uh, and the solutions become replicable. So all these play a role in ensuring adoption becomes much more confident and easy. Uh, I also want to touch upon the role that now we are encouraging students to be part of. Um, I wanted to bring in this concept that the program that we've launched is called Engineering for Good, where we are giving paid internships for students to be part of development sector problems at that stage, whether you are a second year, third year, fourth year engineering student, to know the kind of sector that they can also contribute their skills into. Um, and so, yeah, like the pipeline of problem statements we've collected, it's, it's really encouraging to see the turnout of kids who have applied and, and are part of this. So, that's been the journey of my answer to this. From what you're saying, it's a very tough job. It's a very tough job and uh, you're not just hacking code, but you're hacking how society works. Yeah. Hats off, hats off to you. And wishing you all success because, you know, if you succeed at even a small part of this, Actually, I want to add something to that. 
So when we talk about open source adoption in NGOs or general government organization or inter-government organization, there are two aspects of it. One, either we talk about the workflow adoption on how you use different open source tools for your workflow, or how all these NGOs and government institutions should open source their research, academia content, open data, and open software. Because often they work with partners. There are challenges in both of them. Because I work with a lot of these companies who are trying to adopt or do open source. I have seen a bunch of them. The biggest adoption problem with the workflow is you don't... So think about Indian government and they want to build something. The problem is they don't adopt a project. They procure a product. Right? You can't have that in open source. The biggest challenge you need to think about is we all talk about free and open source, free as in terms of freedom of speech and not free here. A lot of you are, might not have heard free as in free puppy. You can adopt something, but it requires investment, it requires resources to keep it up and grow it with you. How do you talk about sustainability when you have, you start using a tool and suddenly an open source project is not active anymore. There's a sustainability challenge, there's not enough community, right? How can you keep using it? Because an NGO or a lot of times these organizations are not development organizations. A lot of these companies can choose to uh, just assign one engineer on it and then get the product developed. But sustainability is the real question in these things when you're trying to adopt a project. Because you cannot just assign and develop something for yourself. So there's a lack of a lot of businesses around these open source pro projects who can provide you best service. Okay. Right? And when you talk about workflow, I like to highlight the benefits of inner source before going to open source. Anyone who has worked on open source like methodology, I always say open source is not is way more than methodology. It's a movement, it's a culture. We all agree to that. Us coming together, talking about open source is a part of the culture. Right? We are promoting open source, it's the movement that we are doing. And then opening a pull request on GitLab, GitHub, and uh, any one of these online need forces and participating in a community open world, those are methodologies. So highlighting benefit of inner source before you go open source on how it increases efficiency of your developers, efficiency of all the partners working, what's the benefit of public roadmap, how different community can come together and you give a place to the community stakeholder you're trying to solve when you work in open. That's another challenge that we have seen. A lot of people trying to solve something, but the people they're trying to solve, they are not part of it. So we don't have inner insight of exactly what the problem is. So highlighting benefit of how when you work in open, you give space to them to participate in the community. And then there are different efficiency benefits of it on how you become better of it. But then when you talk about making open source tool, the bigger challenge that I've seen often people think, because I work with a lot of these companies and they fear, oh, I have worked on this piece of source of code and it's my IP. You are asking me to give away my IP for free? Because any OSI approved open source license does that. Right? We copy it after being permissive. So it's very important for me to highlight the value proposition of open source. What are the open advantages of an open source project? And highlighting that most of the code written anywhere nowadays, 60% is AI written. Is it truly your IP or is it the ecosystem you build around your IP? For example, I was giving it to someone like Facebook or Twitter. Even if they had their open code open source, it's not the code that matters, it's the people who are on it. So it's the community that you build around your project and tools, be it the documentation, be it the support, be it the culture, like Firefox. Anyone can take their source code and build a uh, browser, but it's still going to use Firefox. Why? Because you know there's a forum around that. You know that there is certain promises that it's going to keep getting developed. So highlighting the benefits of open advantages and then talking about business strategy around open source. Going more than open source IP on how you build an ecosystem around it. Choosing the right licenses around it. Because again, different kind of business strategy will have different licenses. When you want to break through into a market which is not easy open source, a permissive is very useful. Because a banking system will not use a copyright license if they have open source their own code. Because trust me, banking system source codes are a mess. From hardware to API tokens and all the things, they are not built with best practices around it. So going copyleft just because you want to follow the ethos of copyleft, which I love and live copyleft, you can't do that. So you need permissive. But also if you want to protect yourself from these big players just to take your source code and build a business around it, that's when you will copy that. So it's incredibly important for you to understand the business strategy, come up with what the value proposition is of your solution, and then talk about open source. Because it is true, as uh, panelists highlighted, 
open source is often, or technology is often uh, an afterthought. Because your goal is not to do software, your goal is to save children's life. And I'm coming from a perspective. So how do you use tech? And how do you highlight the benefit of open source in tech? To reach that. That's all. Thank you. So one highlight from her answer is, uh, one of the highlights is uh, the program Engineering for Good. So for the students, if you are interested in uh, Look, if you are looking for internship or part-time job, uh, you know where to reach out, whom to reach out. So, yeah, coming back to Vipul. Uh, so you said uh, you work with uh, you work with UNICEF and you work on the public policy and uh, similar fields. Uh, open source policies, yes. Yes. So, uh, in, in in context of India, the uh, the. How, how do you, what do you think about public policy will shape the India's future if uh, the government I mean what what should be the your your thought on this because it's not an easy uh, problem to even, even think of I mean solution to even think of uh, public policy uh, a public policy which uh, force or mandate the government funded bodies to use free and open source software so what 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 is your uh, Answer or answer a suggestion to that. Suppose you are the advisor to the uh, secretary of the Meti. I love that. I love that advice. Okay, so I think it's more than just India. Let's think about generally how open source can enable your cross border collaborations, right? How advanced sustainable development goals. Because there are a lot of solutions. If you are thinking, if you, when we talk open source by default, it's more than just a country development. It's a global development. Okay. When we use Firefox, it's not developed in India, but we can utilize that to empower certain Indian communities that we need to. Uh, but talking about your open source policy, I really like what uh, Free Software Foundation Europe is doing with their public port public money campaign, uh, what European money is doing. They do have, like, I don't know how many of you are aware of the CRA that's coming out in uh, European Union, it's a little bit problematic policy, but they have been working on, and there's code.eu. Uh, um, sorry, I can't remember the URL, but you can actually, European Union, any new code is being developed, it's open source. Right? So there are things around it. But if you think about, just take a step back and what would be the digital utopia of a government? They should not be writing code. They should be empowering their people to write code for them. Again, I'm talking about digital utopia. It's the shiny world where we don't know exactly how it is right now. Government should be describing problems they are trying to solve. You have joined hackathons, you mentioned. There are a lot of students here that they do hackathons and participate in things. Uh, if the people, if the engineering students, and if the people around the General Force community, or any community, if they are participating in trying to solve the problem which actually governments need, or actually intercontinental, like I'm not even talking about Indian government, think UN, United Nations, right? If we need some software for peacekeeping, UN should not be doing software. What should, this should be describing problem statements. And there are so many hackathons happening around people doing, passionate about solving something good. As Frederick mentioned, we want to do something, everyone wants to internally, want to make an impact in the world, right? But the biggest question is, well, how do I do that? How do I know if I'm doing it right? And that's the role government should be playing. One of the bigger problems I've seen adoption is changes like differences in policies. Uh, license problems, like if there's a tool that's developed in, say, Indonesia, can Indian government totally adopt it without understanding in and out of it? And that compliance and the trying to understand exactly what goes into it and what how the license structure to the documentation is like often more work than just writing it yourself. And so many, uh, I think I was telling you, so many NGOs and uh, countries they waste their resources reinventing the wheel, right? So how do you come up with standard which is truly shared and people can understand that? And the same problem with open data. There are different governments, different uh, countries with different stand on what is copyright. <coughs> when we talk about data, when we talk about AI. So what we need is truly a centralized standards, shared standards, which everyone can look at and I agree with that. If there's a tool that's developed using those things, I can I can buy that. I can understand that this would be a good tool to adopt. And that's where it's still public good comes in the picture. Where you have to have open source, but you need more than open source from the sustainability perspective as well. But also, how are exactly advancing sustainable development goals? I don't care about a software that's a new media player. 
I care about a software that's providing quality education to children with, say, example, dyslexia, for whom the technical the education tech platform doesn't work. Right? I care about solutions which actually advancing sustainable development goal and reaching those who can't utilize the same thing. Because remember, 50% of the world still does not have access to internet. Right? So how do you reach those people and actually make an impact? So government should be setting up policies and standards that are easy to understand for researchers, engineers. I should not be worried about, am I violating a copyright? Is this actually goes against the policy? If there's a data set available, can I truly use it and build something on top of it? So setting standards and policies can empower people to participate. It removes that ambiguity where you can go and actually do something. But also, general cross border collaboration. I think I was telling you, if a, if a solution worked in Vietnam or the Philippines in daily outbreak and there is a community in India that also requires it, how easy it is for, for us to take it, adopt it, and scale it? And that's where open source becomes the key enabler for sustainable development goals. goals. So I think uh, I really like the idea of what Digital Public Good Alliance is doing, uh, which is just a shared standard. They have a registry and they have, a, they have open standards on what exactly do we mean by uh, when we say this tool is digital public good. This, this, that should have no proprietary, independ uh, proprietary dependence. If you have an open source software that is so tightly bound with AWS, is it truly can I use it and scale it? Because the, the community that actually require it, they don't have that kind of resources. So how do you build a software that does not depend on a proprietary software? And how do you make sure that you are not collecting PIIs? And if you are collecting PIIs, which is personal identifiable information, you have a policy or you have a guideline that in, within these many days it will be deleted or you can retract all the information. So how do you truly build digital public good right, for people to reach those people? That's why I think government should be playing the biggest role. Because trust me, people power, community, we all know that how much uh, impact is that. You were talking about our hackers. So we, uh, initially what you have done, you have paved path for a lot of these corporations and governments to follow through that early hacker activism that provided the path for a lot of open source thing, that's the crux of it all. So there are a lot of hackers in the world. Government should be making it easy for them to participate and empower them to do something good. What's that roughly close to your answer question? Like, can I answer some of it? I don't know. I might have got a little too passionate. Sorry, I'm sleepy. <laughs> he, he, raised, he raised very tough questions and uh, valid questions, valid questions. But since I sometimes suspect that I suffer from opti over optimism, let me give you a dose of my over optimism. At lunch, we were talking about various philosophical issues. Do Indians contribute to global free and open source? Do we only take back from it? Why are we not doing enough? You know, my point of view is very simplistic. I think that we are still at an earlier stage of our evolution where the internet came to us not many years back. Okay, so high speed internet is a, is a modern reality, not for you all, but for us. And uh, you know things are going to change. Things are already changing. We need we need role models. We need we need to understand the policy problems. We need to understand cultural problems. To raise a difficult issue, uh, I think each culture has its own strengths and weaknesses. And at the risk of saying a very unpopular thing, uh, maybe we in our part of the world look at knowledge as power in that sense more than others. Whereas uh, if you look at Sweden, I'm not saying they are great. We also have our own strengths. But those guys, like they, they have a history of openness, you know, going back 200 years, where uh, something like the right to information was available then. Uh, here things are changing, things are changing, things are changing fast. We have our strengths, we have a very strong solidarity at a social level. We have a strong sense of, uh, you know, making sure that our technology is affordable, like the Chinese, we, India and China are two countries, we do it. But when it comes to creating and sharing, we have to prove ourselves. I'm sure we will prove ourselves, but it's taking time. It's not that it's not there, but uh, I was just saying over lunch, over here, over here, you know, if, if, if your mind does not know it, we are not going to see it. So, so we have to build that faith in ourselves. But above all, I would appeal to techies to hack not only your code, but to hack society, to find solutions, to find solutions to very real life problems. The same thing you learn in engineering college can be used to any field. One coming not over speak. In my current experience, incredibly proud of Indian FOSS community. We are doing a lot. We are everywhere in any open source project. If you see, there is not a wall untouched by what Indian community is doing. And we are growing ever so with the fastest speed. 
go check Google Summer of Code. There is some nastiness in it with Indian community, but we are at the utmost of. Uh, if you do you know Apache project, any one of you aware of Apache project? Have you, uh, yes. Go and check that. How many uh, interns? How many people actually hacking on be it edge post, humanitarian free and open source software, but generally also free and open source software. India is doing it. So the part you have been a good one. And you said role model. We have you. We have you. We have a lot of coming on. There are people who have actually done from the start. Before I was born, OSI. The year OSI was formed was my birth year. But since then, Indian has been part of it. And I, I had traveled to all of the important open source conferences, and one thing I see a lot is a lot of Indian faces, and not just attending, presenting and talking about and how to do what's next. But we need a national network. And yes. What you all are doing is, is a step in the right direction. Exactly, and I think that's always been a thing of open source community. A lot of bubbles doing their own thing and then connecting at, at one point, right? We have DevCon, we have PyCon, every year has been happening for us. 15, 20 years, and we have so many different communities. And there are so many Linux user groups all over the world, all over India. If you go to Bangalore, that's how I did it. One thing that we share, Vishal, is doing, uh, starting an open source club and just trying to invite people to speak. As I would go on meetups on Saturdays and Sundays and invite them in my university to talk about it. Right? So I have seen a lot, like if you're in Bangalore and if you try to search all the meetups happening in open source, you'll see tons of those every week. Right? So slowly we are growing, and we are growing at a very fast pace. But also, as a global south perspective, I know in India it's like right we're in, in, in between, but global north, mostly European and North American places, they have made a lot of mistakes. And how does global south learn from those and do it as better? I think we have that going on for us. Because look, technology, while enabler, can also destroy things. So we can do it right, we have that opportunity as well. True. So I, yeah. I yeah. pass the mic towards the, yes. Oh, it's okay, I'll speak out loud. So, uh, the point I was trying to understand is, uh, you said that you use uh, Google Forms, right? We had a passage who shared TensorFlow Lite and TensorFlow. What I'm trying to understand is, as free open source community, open source is when you give the code back to the community. Both these, uh, these instruments don't give code back. So, I'll give you an example of Heroku. It's a free source tool, right? But they stop their operations. So there are many organizations that will depend on Heroku. Okay? On the counter side of that, there is something called as OpenAI. It started as an open source organization and then they made a closed source organization. So my question is specifically to Vipul. How do you, as you said, try to avoid this? So what I think, my perspective with this is, people ride on the open source wave saying it's a free software, they get the organic growth inside, they get the customers inside, and once they are at this level, they stop it out. So, do you educate users on this? Because there is a confusion between what is free software to use and what is a free open source software. Right? Free software versus free service. Yeah, so there is a TensorFlow Lite. It's a, a free software that we can use. Right? But if Google decides, they can stop it at any point in time. So there is that, that is the issue with every community. No, no I have actually, I don't think so. What license does TensorFlow use? I don't think they are open source their code. It's a free service that we are using. Yeah, so let's take an example of yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when she says Google Forms, I think TensorFlow is open source. So TensorFlow Lite, TensorFlow Lite, and TensorFlow as well. I don't think the source code is actually released to the public, right? I think it's 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 so I'll tell you something. You mentioned something about giving the source code. Any, I think just just to make sure we are on the same page. Can I take a minute to describe what free and open source software mean yeah. exactly? So again, I mentioned something free as in terms of freedom of speech, not free peer. We are not talking about free money here. A open source tool can totally be paid software, right? But when we say free and open source software, there are four essential freedom that has to, to be followed. One, personally for me, it should be following an OSI approved license. And that license assures those freedom. First freedom is freedom to read. When I buy a software or when I use a software, I must be able to read the source code of it. If I don't see the source code, it is not open source software. I should be able to run it any way I see it. So second is freedom to run. I want to run it on my phone, on my laptop. Being able to run it or not is a totally different question here. But I should be able to run it any way I see fit. Third is revise. I want to make a change, I should totally be able to do it. And the last is redistribute. When you buy a proprietary solution CD or for an operating system, you see do not share with your friend that will void your license. With open source software, you cannot do that. Redistribution comes inherently as the freedom part of open source. So, 
Yes. What the examples you gave, I don't agree with them. They're not exactly the right example, but there are open source tools that have changed their license to non-OSI approved. Anyone knows server side public license? Yeah, SSPL. SSPL? Yeah. I don't want to name projects, but they used to be uh, Apache project, Apache license project, and then they changed to SSPL. And that's where you need to understand. As in, as in, even if we have a, I didn't want to name the project, but, and there are more. Sanitary has done that, that they have made a business license. So the idea is that, okay, they were open source project, people made contributions to those under those circumstances, and they ended up changing the license. The problem is, do they hold the copyright to it? And that's where CLA come, becomes a very controversial topic, contribution license agreement. Why would I wave off my copyright of the code? And if you see CLA in projects, and I'm not talking about developer uh, agreement, which is just like you can use it, you should be holding the right of the code you have written. Right? So as a user that you see when you make your contribution, it's very important for you to understand the value you're creating and the kind of community you're giving back to. You should not be backstabbed that they've changed something. So think about it. You want to accept a CLA that says that you wave off the copyright because the moment you introduce CLA, at some point it's about actually we want to change it and maybe make a proprietary license of it. Because you cannot contribute to a GPL license and I can change it anytime I wish because that's your copyrighted code. And that's the litigation. So a lot of the time, yes, again, I cannot say that there are no bad players. There are bad players who will take your contribution, there's a CLA in good faith, you uh, assume good and then you contribute it and they change the license. But that's okay. Most of the things happen like everywhere. You cannot remove any bad players in any market. But that's not how open source community is defined. There are very few. TensorFlow is open source code. And if the, if the source is not open, then it's I not think open. It's, it's open source. Yeah, it is open source. It's yes. a Apache license. Okay. So my point is, are we actually having these batches where she's at Google Home, right? And there is Heroku, there is uh, Firebase. So people are usually graduated to a free open source. It goes to his points wherein he says the people don't have the uh, expertise to run the architecture. When it's a free service, the expertise is given by a company which allows you to do so. So let's say there's an organization, the NGO that uses Google Docs for all their data. And tomorrow Google makes it private. The flood situation again happens over here, but it's a corporate greed that we are making us do this, right? Are there any steps that we are taking to actually make sure that we should not use? Because there's something called as ODK that yeah. you can use, right? ODK is more open source. Mm. There's a clear distinction why ODK should be used and not Google Home. Right. So, so I, these two organizations, like UNICEF, you being a very big organization, mm. are you taking some steps to make yes. sure user I, I think it's management decision to I'll uh, answer that. Yeah. Okay. So Google Forms is not open source as far as my understanding. Yes. So that's that's again that's the wrong example. I would say Lanyu Survey is if you want to run it. But why if you look at any open source project and the service you get they're often not free. Free service to use and free code, that's a bad business strategy. How do you sustain that? Infrastructure comes out of money. So if you truly value what you are using, you gotta pay for it. Think about it. Google is free, they are taking your data. They are taking your data, they already got your data. That's how they are trying to get you into the big ecosystem, be it vendor logging or anything. Right? TensorFlow, though, the example you gave is to be open source. So you use it, you build it, you, you scale some, make some product, and you, it's Apache license, and you can change it to GPL if you wish to. But from coming from what we are doing, that's where I mentioned Digital Public Good Alliance, DPG, Digital Public Good. We have a registry. You can go and submit your project, and it has to follow, follow nine indicators. Right? I want to take a step back and actually get that question. Even if something is open source, first of all, free service, free code, how is that company making money? Because infrastructure costs money. So that's a big red flag. You need to think about what you're paying for it. Uh, and you should pay for open software to everyone. But let's say the platform independence part that I mentioned. You have an open source project, but it's dependent on a proprietary solution. You can't scale it. If I want to run my own instance of it of without any extreme cost or without any depending on a proprietary solution, I can't do that. So the DPGA is one part that UNCEF is doing. And I will also tell you something. I'm reading open source in UNICEF and I often say we are not, we don't wish to be a tourist in this space. I'm here and we are here to participate in the community and do more open source all the time. But UNICEF is not a software company. In certain way, in traditional sense, when you think about what software is, we predate software, right? 
So our main goal is to do humanitarian work, medical responses, emergency responses, on ground, trying to provide schooling, education to water and sanitization hygiene. Open source part and the technology part is the far quadrant of what we do. On a very small scale, I think 2% of all of what UNICEF does. Right? So we are very much on field and then we are trying to utilize technology to see how we can uh, make good of it. But if a, that's why you need to evaluate any project and that's where risk analysis and risk tolerance come in. Adoption question that we discussed about any NGO and that's where I mentioned sustainability of it. It is true. If someone is adopting an open source tool, obviously you can go and fork it. But then comes all the overhead on you to maintain it. So those are the challenges which truly mentioned is exist that you use an open source tool and it might not be open source after something. But that's where you think about the license, the uh, community that we have built around it, the ecosystem there is around it. For example, if I work for Fedora project, and I truly I can tell you that if we ever decide not to do Fedora project, there will be enough people. That's my personal opinion. There will be enough people to take up the community and run it. When CentOS uh, uh, Linux, CentOS Linux, not Stream, closed their like shut shop for CentOS 8, Rocky and Armand Linux came and started building from the real uh, distributions. That's where the power of community comes in. When MySQL went uh, not open source, MariaDB came in and took the place. And that's what by default a lot of the operating system also point to when you install MySQL, it installs MariaDB. And that's the power of community, I would say. And again, look for the digital public good alliance. I think they're running late. Uh, so one last question for the panelists.
a, a certain senior management or an idea that they have and then how that trickles down and has to go through changes because of user experience and, and the end game that happens and the changes that organizations he's interacted with has had to go, gone through. Same, same experience here as well. Um, so I was, my answer was also, uh, it's a work in progress situation for us, but uh, you are right in terms of policy, in terms of people, in terms of processes, all of those would have a lot of aberration as we have to work through. So we start on very small understanding on the first thing that we can work with uh, when there is a buy-in at that current state of the organization and that state immediately changes in three months you see new people working on that. Um, so we are trying to make it in terms of phases as much as possible, the low hanging fruit being the one that we look at first and then if we succeed using them as an example for other organizations saying even if they are small, they put a tech policy in place. They are an education-based organization. So a bunch of other education-based organizations because there's a lot of peer learning. Like I, you, as soon as you said RKM or you know, like in philanthropies, it strikes. Or ATRI, uh, the, the fact that ATRI works on environment and all other natural resource management organizations would generally know about them. If they know ATRI has adopted a certain CRM system, the, the curious, curiosity at least uh, is something that we bank on a lot. Um, small changes, but it's it's looking impactful, and so we just power through it. So yeah. just uh, add on, like, so as a tech company, should we push for policy change? It would be ideal that there is a lot of conversation around from different forces who are engaged with that NGO for sure. What that um, be overstepping? At scope? least the conversation is good. The thing is, they largely rely on such companies also to bring words into meetings. The minute you might say tech policy, you might not have to be fully involved in it, but the person attending or listening to this word might go back and say that didn't strike us before. They might not want you to do it, but it's good to have that kind of engagement and conversation, definitely. That's lacking a lot, so even if we can't, uh, we can't go into hire a tech person in your company, right? Or, or come back and say, we have three interns, create positions. But the fact that it would be nice to have like a database manager is a thought we do bring up. The decision is of course theirs, but that kind of community and camaraderie is very important for them also to know what decisions to make. So that's how I would approach it, if that makes sense. Thank you so much. So I would like to conclude this. Uh, Just points. Yes. 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 Just two quick points. One is that FOSS has a lot of advantages, but the uh, entry point and the learning curve is very steep. So please keep in mind that everyone who is new to it needs support, especially the non-profits. Secondly, if we can link up with affiliated movements, whether it's open access, uh, whether it's Wikipedia, whether it's Creative Commons, because the non-profit world has a lot to do with data and information. And all these are system movements in the sense, they share a certain region. That's all. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, it was very insightful for me and I hope it was for all of you as well. A uh, lot of learnings and I hope, uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping a lot of you have questions but I know you are, uh, since we are running out of time for this, uh, we can have this, uh, you can have the questions from them after the conference, we'll have some tea and a talking time. So yeah, once again, thank you all of you, three of you for the all of your insights. An answer and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll keep doing more discussions like this and question open questions from the participant yeah i'll ask the volunteers for the next round of talks to start yeah. it didn't even go to sleep